70 slides to get through. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yes, welcome everyone to AWS User Group Sydney. I'm not sure when was the last um, in person meetup, um, but uh, I'm excited to be here and I'm, again, really grateful for, for all of you coming today. Um, I'm talking about a holistic approach to FinOps in the cloud. And um, my name's Chris Gondek, but I'm also very affectionately and sometimes not affectionately referred to as Gondo. Um, those of you who are old enough to remember The Muppet Show, I'm just trying to see how many folks have as many grey hairs as I do out there, will remember, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> so most people know me as Gonzo, um, and, and feel free to call me Gonzo if you want to have a chat after the session to learn a bit, of, a bit more about what we're speaking about today. I just realised I've left something over here that I need my presentation. I have some props today that I'm going to use, which are really <laughs> important, and I'll come back to those in just a moment. So, First thing I need to do is to call out the fact that I'm, a, I'm the imposter among you. I don't know how many of you know of the game Among Us, not as long as but uh, I am not a developer, nor am I a data scientist. I've, uh, you know, but I do 
work with the fallout of what you do. So this is a very appropriate meme when I think about the misery that people cause me sometimes. In this is why we're here talking about power cost optimization, all right? Um, but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, uh, a long history in infrastructure, which has become infrastructure as a service. Uh, I, was, I, I said I'm not a data scientist, um, but that, you know, Excel is about as much data science as I do. Um, so, you know, I just want to call that out straight. <coughs> but I do feel like I have earned some uh, presence here today because uh, I'm going to talk about um, stuff that's happening in cloud and tr to try and save you all some money. So when I think about cloud, I think about cloud words. This is a cloud word. Um, ironically, it's a cloud word about cloud. And you can see that, um, you know, back in the day when I thought about cloud, um, it had so many different meanings when it first came out, but we all, all arrived at infrastructure platform software basically as a service. And what I like about this cloud word um, spread that we've got here, the word service is quite prominent. We've got to think about it that way. It's almost a financial model, isn't it? All right. We're not building real estate data centers and racking and stacking equipment like we used to. We are literally swiping our credit card and consuming infrastructure platform and software as a service. So the next thing that I see that pops out to me, apart from cloud computing itself, is applications. That's what we use cloud computing for to run our applications. So, what is ours? What is the residual asset? What are we creating when we abandon our physical infrastructure and go to a hyperscaler? <coughs> Data. That's the next big thing that sticks out there. So, this brings me to, you know, FinOps. What is it and why do we need it? And, by the way, I tried to do a search on um, the cl a cloud word for FinOps. It didn't exist, so I actually made that one up. So, if for no other reason tonight than this, this will be the night you'll remember where Gonzo made a FinOps cloud word. And it's out there on the internet and he will be you know, noted for doing that. Um, but what is it? I, I really like this FinOps Foundation um, terminology because it aids to my messaging to you tonight. It's a cultural practice and it needs business and teams to collaborate on data-driven spending decisions. Okay? I'm not just here to talk about Look at my cloud bill, I have shock. Reduce my cloud bill, I feel better. Um, I'm actually gonna talk about that holistic approach. So it's at this point that some of you who've been in the industry for some time might think, but you're from Netta. You sell toasters, which is a, you know, a bit of a play on words on the very first thing we made 31 years ago this year, you believe, was this, a network attached storage file, a NAS device. And it was affectionately known as the toaster, because let's face it, it looks like a toaster. But what we actually made before the toaster was the operating system and the file system that ran on it. And that file system was called Waffle. Not the kind of waffle that you see there, but W-A-F-L, the Write Anywhere File Layout. And that is <coughs> going to be extremely important for the future. I'm going to come back to that. But the operating system is called ONTAP. And the founders, uh, we're sitting there in a bar on the back of a napkin thinking, you know what, data's going to keep growing and exploding, it's going to get huge and we're going to need to consume it in large portions at some point in the future. So wouldn't it be cool if I could serve data on tap? And they called that the storage operating system. In fact, every iteration and version of it since, it's now three decades of innovation, has been named after a beer. And you'll see there's even some Aussie beers that have made uh, an appearance in there. Like, uh, well, Foster's doesn't count unless you've had beer outside Australia um, and vegan and that sort of thing. So why am I telling you all of this? You know, why am I starting from the um, storage component? Um, there's, there's method to my madness, so bear with me. Who is NetApp today? And so I'm actually going to put on my NetApp hat. But, um, I think I even say literally. Um, these are our new toasters. They're amazing. They're super fast. They're all flash. We've got capacity series. We've got these boxes and those boxes, got you covered in the data center, but I'm here to talk about cloud cost optimization. So part of the word cloud to me is hybrid. You know, there's workloads that are on-prem that we're gonna bring up into uh, the hyperscalers. But this is a small portion of our portfolio. Remember we started with software. You see on tap is data management software. And this thing called BlueXP is our user experience across it. 
But this entire hardware portfolio, and that is all of it, makes up a very small portion of our software portfolio. And you'll notice there, cloud data storage. We've got uh, a bunch of first party services in hyperscalers and we've got data services and we've got cloud ops, which forms part of our FinOps story. So I'm gonna cover off um, some of that. But I have to start with what is this holistic approach to FinOps? What am I here to talk about today? And yesterday, if you were at the AWS Summit, you would have heard in the keynote um, by Rianne, the three key kind of um, things was data, cost optimization, and sustainability. And there's gonna be elements of sustainability throughout my talk today. So those, uh, that kind of complete, uh, or sorry, uh, the um, holistic approach to FinOps, I call complete cost optimization. And I'm gonna cover off four specific areas. The first one is data. Because remember, that's the thing we're generating. All of our applications, all our workloads are generating tons of data, and that costs money to store it, to manage it, and to do things around it. That then leads to information. You know, data is the language of machines, information is the language of humans. Um, we then get to infrastructure right sizing. This one is really important, especially if you weren't born in the cloud and you're migrating to cloud. And then the last one, workload intelligence. Now, we're gonna come back to this at the very end to kind of piece it all together to show you how it all works. So, let's start with data or storage through efficiencies. And this is where I need to change hats. And actually, I'm gonna go one step further. I need to take this one. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna suddenly transform to AWS storage guy. Right. <laughs> and uh, the reason I'm doing this is because we have this thing, which is very cool, called Amazon FSx for NetApp on tap. This is not a NetApp product. It is an AWS managed service in the FSX family. In fact, Rianne said during the keynote yesterday the words NetApp on tap as part of her conversation in those data services that are built into AWS services. We are super proud of that and we are super happy to be working with AWS in this way by then embedding a technology that we founded the company on. And it's got heaps of really cool stuff. You see there, snapshot flex clones, built-in tiering. It's fully managed petabyte scale high performance. Now, again, why is Gonzo banging on about storage, right? If everything is data and data is storage, the storage should be important. So what are we doing um, from an FSX perspective? Efficiencies through compression, deduplication, compaction, compression, these will make a much smaller footprint on the primary workloads. This will make a much smaller footprint to work with and of course we pay through consumption and cloud. We are cost optimizing from the ground up. It doesn't matter what data you're dumping into my repository, I'm gonna look at those blocks and I'm gonna squash it. I'm gonna make it cheaper. Um, I'm also gonna make it faster performing. I'm gonna do things like flexible clones. If you're in a dev test environment, instead of a portion of the data, I can give you an entire read write copy in seconds, in cloud, through the AWS console. Remember, this is a native AWS product. Now it also works with all of the other cloud native services, cloud native product. Of course, it should connect to all of these. But you'll also notice the three protocols down there, SMB, NFS, and iSCSI. Now if I'm doing ZGU compaction, compression, thin provisioning, tiering, all these technologies, and then putting multiple protocols on top from that same storage virtual machine, I'm compounding exponentially those, those savings. If you think about which workloads use SIFs, could be the desktops and workspaces, which workloads use NFS, could be an Oracle database, which workloads use iSCSI. There's also VMware Cloud on AWS. This is a big one. Anyone who knows about VMware Cloud on AWS will know that it works in a very lockstep HCI fashion, descent. Very hard to scale out. You have to buy a lot of nodes and have unnecessary compute and memory. It needs an independently scalable storage service. Guess which one was the first one to be supported for external NFS data stores in VMware? Amazon FSX for data contact. So you see there's so many use cases just starting from the ground up with the storage. The inline efficiencies, dedu, compression, compaction. This is probably one of the first times I have a little bit of a sustainability message here. If I can get you three to one and eight to one data reductions, 
I can actually eliminate 17.4 metric tons of CO2 per year. And we've got some uh, real data to back this. So if you have sustainability in mind and you want to kill two birds with the one stone, get cost optimization while saving the planet at the same time, feel good about yourself. Don't get greenwashed um, by the A triple C. This is good stuff. Okay, tiering is something that we're doing more and more. This is now going, okay, not only am I gonna make it smaller by squashing it down, I'm also gonna look at it and go, you know what? These blocks that are cold, I'm gonna move them off to a more effective tier of storage. Now, the application and the data, they're gonna be completely transparent to this. All they see is all of the data. But the storage service is moving out those cold blocks out to cloud or from AWS FSx on tap into S3. And we're getting, again, more efficiencies and more CO2 reductions. These are real numbers backed by real MIT studies. So we're still kind of a little bit on the storage bandwagon. Oh, by the way, that doesn't include energy savings from cooling. Remember, if you can make a smaller box and smaller consumption, even AWS, who has to report up into the NGER on their consumption and uh, you know, carbon neutrality, um, they will shrink that consumption as the data footprint shrinks as well. Now this one is really close to my heart. I've been in the IT industry for 25 years. 15 of those years I was a backup guy. Worked for Commvault and Veritas. And I did a lot of data protection, disaster recovery. I'll ask a lot of people, you know, how much of your storage footprint, um, you know, if you were going to break it down for me into percentages, tell me the, the makeup of your data. And folks will say to me, I've got 33% app data, maybe 33% user data, 33% um, mail data. Let's call it that. And I'll say, okay, but that's not your entire data footprint, is it? And they're looking at me funny. You've just told me your production data footprint. You're actually 33% production data, 66% secondary and tertiary copy. Why? We've got to make backups, right? So if you think about the primary copy where we've reduced the data. We maintain the efficiencies across the life cycle. When we do a backup and a DR copy to the other side, it's already did you keep that compressed and squashed. When we make the tertiary copy out to long, long-term retention storage, Amazon Glacier, <coughs> S3IA, et cetera, again, the efficiencies are retained. You get a 3X carbon footprint reduction, 3X cost reduction. People aren't thinking about the backups. It's not cool, it's not sexy. Unless you're me, I'm trying to desperately make it so, <laughs> through these sort of things, right? So that is the storage side, right? We squash it, we make it small, and no matter where we move it around, we make it really small. But that's looking at it from the ground up. I see a bunch of ones and zeros, and I can, you know, dejuke them, compact and compress them. Um, what about information intelligence through classification? I don't have a hat for this one, so I'll actually call that out. We are using AI machine learning to crack open the data. You're using NLP. We're reading the contents, putting it through the AI engine. The rules engine extracts things like personal identifiers, but we're also doing metadata extraction. Now, yes, this has a compliance and security element to it, but it also helps us to look at things like, where can I make savings? I know what's stale. I know what's non-business. I know what's duplicate files. I can't tell that from a storage efficiency perspective. If I'm in the business of making cat videos and I have a lot of cat videos, that might be my business data. But if you're the rest of the world that's not in the business of cat videos but happens to hold a lot of cat videos, then that would come up in your non-business data scan and you can do things like optimize storage, optimize storage, optimize storage. Another way of looking at it, ground up, top down, all right, we've squashed the data, we've made some intelligence uh, around significantly cost optimizing that. So there's tick box one, storage tick box two, classification. This also helps us to continue to reduce our carbon footprint. If we can tier data off to the hyperscaler from data centers, or if we can find data that's duplicate or could be deleted non-business, then again, we're saving massive tons of CO2 each year and significantly reducing our consumption of that service. So this brings me to observability. What is right-sizing infrastructure? So I've made it small and I've put it up in the cloud 
but you know my finance person who loves to dictate that they want the best hardware because they uh, have this big mission critical application and because it was 64 processors in the data center, I want a 64 core system in the cloud. And you know, the Gorilla series, what is that, 16,000 US a month or something. You give it to them, and then you find over time that they barely blip 1% usage at a 30 day. You're paying for that unnecessary infrastructure. This is what right sizing through observability is. Now, I have nowhere near enough time to cover all of this. Observability literally requires its own unique session to talk about that kind of stuff, but it's very valuable. I encourage you to take a look at it both across your serverless container architecture and your virtual infrastructure or your infrastructure as a service platform and understand through monitoring how to optimize those workloads. One way to look at it would be slicing and dicing all of that IoT telemetry data. And I think I said it on the previous slide, or maybe I didn't. This complements CloudWatch. In fact, there's a lot of AWS folks who are using our Cloud Insights product to look at on-premises environments to get them pre-packaged ready for migration to cloud, to look at right-sizing before deploying those Gorilla instances. And you know, there's a bunch of stuff on the screen here. This is for you to take away and have a look at, but we present this information back to give you this kind of waste management approach through infrastructure right-sizing. But the number one thing that we come across more than any other is this. Do I really need that SSD class EBS? Do you know how many EBS volumes we find that are seriously underutilized and you're paying for us? Worse, how many orphan EBS volumes we find? You're paying for that. It belongs to nothing. No EC2 instance is ever going to mount it and fire it up. And you don't even know what data might be in there, but that was the previous thing. So there's number three um, through observability. So the last one I am not authorized to talk about. I'm actually going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Mark Deeks, who's going to take you through workload intelligence through CloudOps for our SWAT portfolio. All right, so I'm Mark. Uh, so I, I guess work alongside or with Chris or Bask in his shadow, I guess. He's a very talkative guy. Um, but I work in the SWAT part of the NetApp business. So um, as I said, everybody, first of all, I am the only person at NetApp who will not talk to you about storage, who will not talk to you about data. What I talk about is compute, how we consume compute, uh, how we do it in an optimized way, how we do it in a, an effective way, a cost-effective way. We do have, <laughs> we do have <laughs> other parts of our portfolio that work in with that observability piece, and that is a large contingent of FinOps. Monday night was FinOps Foundation over at Atlassian Building. I'm not sure if anybody else was there, but I kind of sat there as a, <laughs> I kind of sat there as a pretend <laughs> FinOps practitioner, uh, looking at all these guys, and they say, I wanted you know, a little bit of spot glory. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, all these different things that you do to, to do FinOps properly. Um, I'm not going to talk to all of them because I've got five minutes. Um, I'm only going to talk to a couple of pieces that, that we do and we talk about a lot with, with customers or in our spot portfolio. And it's really touching on three different areas of the way that people, or that we see that people are consuming cloud. Um, some of it reflects their cloud maturity. Some of it reflects the maturity of the applications they choose to deploy to cloud because as much as you may want to go 100% containers, you know, there's still something that's never going to fit in there. So you always got something over here on the left hand side, which is your monolithics, your legacy, your stuff that's not built for cloud, you know, was brought out 20 years ago and you just have to keep running it. You know, it's stuff where you have to manage your commitments, your ROIs, your savings, that type of thing. Yeah. Virtual machines in the middle that can actually work with some of our uh, scaling technologies in the cloud, things that will scale up and down based on demand. Um, perhaps they're stateless, um, so you know, we don't necessarily care about the individual instance that's running. Who cares if it goes away, as long as it's replaced by another one, we've got resources there to serve our application. We don't care, we're fine with that. Um, the third one is obviously containers, which is uh, there is a fourth I'm not mentioning, but essentially containers. Um, that is where I guess some people are going, some people already are, some people have never heard of it. Um, but there's really different solutions there that we have for those different use cases depending on what people are doing. Some people will use only one, and people who've just got their whole data center and chucked it in the cloud because the CIO said I had to. Uh, who cares that it now costs five times as much? We're in the cloud, excellent. You know, that's where you're gonna play. People who have only ever been in the cloud, you know, they're gonna exist in all of these second and third 
Despite the portfolio, I guess, of where we sit, what we actually do, I don't get involved in applications. I don't care what your storage is. I leave that to the people who worry about storage and data. Um, we never get involved in that. We never see your application or anything like that. We're sitting kind of in the middle of where your virtual machines are, where your containers are, and the cloud infrastructure. Um, in case it's bothering anybody else, I do know the AWS logo isn't centered down the bottom. Um, it may or may not have deleted some other logos from this slide. And, and, and that's as much as I can get away with it. And we'll just use, we don't, we don't use the reality. Reality. I said the other thing. That was mentioned yesterday in, in, on stage, so I can say the other. Um, but that's, that's really where we sit. We're sitting in between what you're doing with the application, how you're consuming infrastructure, um, you know, making sure that we're deploying infrastructure that is needed, it's necessary, and that we're doing it in a cost-effective way. This is essentially what it looks like if you're consuming our products. Spot, as you may have guessed, we're focused on consuming Spot instances as much as we can. Um, how many people have heard of Spot instances before I pretend to explain them to people right now? Awesome. So you know what they are, you know the problem with them, you get a two minute notification, you get a two minute interruption, right? So you may be able to deal with that. Some people try and DIY it and pull their hair out. Um, I spoke to a bank. I spoke to a bank who pre-COVID were running a lovely Oracle platform on spot instances and they were having the time of their life. <laughs> COVID came and all of a sudden the demand on spot instances was um, significantly greater. And they're like, what's all these interruptions? Why am I having to go through a 40 minute restart time on my stack every single interruption? So there's things that work on it and things that don't. So those two, the second and the third um, columns where I talked about things that scale or, or containerized platforms, they're the ones that are gonna be landing on spot. You committed, uh, your, your monolithics, you know, just leave them running on our eyes. But they're the ones that we're gonna try and run on spot. And we just enable people to consume it because we have intelligence behind it so we know when these interruptions are going to occur. We're not sitting there waiting for a notification to come. We actually know and we're predicting ahead of time when they're going to occur, an hour out of time, so that we can make sure that all the infrastructure you've got provisioned on the right-hand side, all the infrastructure you've got provisioned is matching what your applications are demanding. If there's a spot in instance that's going to be taken back, we're not sitting there waiting for a two-minute notification or seeing an instance disappear, and you know, we're proactively replacing that as part of our technology. People ask me how it works. Sometimes I just say AI, ML, magic. Sometimes I explain it to certain things who, who I'm talking to. Um, FinOps overall, oops, is that too far? FinOps overall, these are kind of the three, I guess, points that I've got to touch on in my small window of time that I've got to speak. You know, reducing cost of cloud infrastructure by up to 80%. People say lots of numbers. I saw them say on stage during the spot session yesterday that uh, you can get a discount of up to 90%. I've never said 90% in my life, but I'm certainly going to start saying it now. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe West said, so I'm it wrong. Uh, but essentially, we're automating the use of spot instances, getting full value of your RIs and savings plans. Yes, we do stuff for, for savings plans and RIs. Um, I always introduce it as the technically boring product because you don't do anything with infrastructure. You just cover what you've got there. But there's plenty of people there who have bought RIs or bought savings plans, and they never fully utilize them. I spoke to a customer uh, just recently spoken to them a year ago and said, we should do this. And they said, no, nah, we'll do it ourselves. You come up and then a year into their savings plan, have a look at what they've done. They bought a savings plan. And I think the most heavily utilized it was, was one month to hit 75%. And that, is a, that, is, that is the worst one I've seen. Uh, and they're just wasting money. And it's like, well, do we want to actually do something else this year or do we want to go through that again? Um, so hopefully they'll come on board, but we'll see. The one in the middle, re reduced infrastructure operations burden by 85%. I talked to that around um, potentially, or particularly people who are running um, container platforms. Um, we will do a lot of the, of the decision making around what instances you're deploying into that container platform. A lot of people will use cluster auto scale as their scaling mechanism inside their container platforms. Give that the flick, we replace it with our products. We make intelligent decisions around what instance gets deployed. Who cares if somebody 10 years ago, or maybe not 10 years ago, containers, a couple of years ago, said we should deploy C5, 12XLs, or whatever it is, right? I don't care that somebody said that made that determination and said it in the config. We look at what are your containers consuming from a resource perspective, what resources are in your cluster, what headroom, which is essentially spare capacity for pods to be scheduled into, but also what are the spot markets look like? You know, which one's on the high demand, which one's on the low demand, who's gonna last longer? How many vCPUs have you got deployed across all the different AZs? We don't want to put them all in one just because there's availability there. We still need to spread them out over there because um, you know, if the worst happens and AZ goes down, you don't want to be out of the pants. The third one, um, simplifying application delivery. 
There are a few other things we're doing there around containers. Um, there is a CD product that we're, that we're bringing out and working with and how you actually deploy your applications. Um, I won't go into that too much detail because I barely understand it. Um, <laughs> but cloud ops, I see cloud ops, it's kind of cloud ops spin ops. You know, it's, it's, that's where we're working in with. And these are the different things that we're working with. There's a few products down the bottom which I won't go into in too much detail. But the key thing that I always mention is yes, optimization is important. Visibility is obviously important. The automation ones for me is the most important. You know, I don't do operations anymore and I'm glad about that. But if I could deploy something that's actually going to run itself and I don't have to babysit it and I can pretend to my manager that I'm doing an awesome job saving money, <laughs> that's a good result in my book. So happy to go over this in more detail with anybody who wants to spend more than five minutes on it. But also, I'll hand you back to Gonzo. Big round of applause for Mike. <laughs> I am wrapping up now, folks, I promise. I, I did say that there would be a bit of a sustainability um, portion to the presentation tonight. You've seen some of that through how we're directly translating consumption into, uh, I guess, uh, carbon reduction. Um, so these were the four ways of our complete view of cost optimization. We started with storage at the bottom through efficiencies. We then went through into intelligence and analysis to classify data. We then went through to the infrastructure analysis and right sizing workloads and finished up at the end with the true intelligence of optimization through leveraging the intelligence of AWS and their spot instance capabilities and reserved instances through um, savings plans and things like that. However, we need to be able to measure sustainability accurately. If we want to get those carbon credits from uh, the, I think they're called the ACCUs or ACUs or something like that. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate to the authorities that you're doing so. So we're actually pioneering in this space with our sustainability dashboard and a score. We also have the ability to act on the right hand side there. Just like Mark talked about how important it is to do the automation. Don't just tell me where I can save money. Do it for me and start saving money for me. It's the same thing if you've got sustainability goals. We need to be able to measure that from multiple different feeds. Um, AWS is extremely mature in this space. They actually do report to NGER. If you ever have a chance, look that up. They're really good like that. We take those feeds and we bring them in here. We even go down to specific details with things like direct CO2 usage. Um, I think there's another kilogram of carbon per terabyte there. Because you know, remember, at the end of the day, it's residual data that you're generating. That data footprint that's left behind has gravity associated with it and therefore a carbon emission that's associated with it. This is all backed by MIT research. Um, so we help our organisations get those carbon credits and avoid the greenwashing from the ACCC to kind of demonstrate that um, you are setting sustainability metrics, working towards them and hitting them. So in summary, what is complete cost optimization with NetApp in AWS? Starting with the storage and the efficiencies, a really good service in AWS. I really encourage you to check out FSx for that app on tap. Multi-protocol, mega storage efficiencies, ultra-fast instant snapshots of any petabyte sizes of data with tiering fee provisioning, digit compaction compression, all mixed in, disaster recovery, long-term retention, copies, all of that's retained. Information through classification. The data sense tool isn't designed just for NetApp storage. You can look at OneDrive, Google Drive, SharePoint Online, any share. You can look at um, data repositories in AWS across the different shares, S3 buckets, all tiers of S3, um, EFS, you name it, and find out if you're hosting those cat videos. Um, infrastructure right sizing through observability, Cloud Insights, very powerful observability tool for right sizing your workloads. Get off those 64 core gorilla instances down to 16. Interesting connection. Increasing the storage speed for one of our customers significantly reduced their infrastructure needs. It also meant that going from a 64 core system to a 16 core system reduced their Oracle licensing by 75%. These are the sort of things that come out from IoT and analytics and algorithms and these permutations that we've never seen before because we've got all these data points coming together. And lastly, most importantly, workload intelligence through automation. Spot is extremely powerful, impressive stuff. I've never seen anything like it. And I will add in there, I know we're at an AWS user group, we're probably mostly engineering and technology folks, but if you want to go back and impress the business, the cost model is 
you only pay a portion of what we save you. Okay, you've got nothing to lose there. Folks, thank you so much for your attention tonight. I know we've probably run over a little bit, but uh, I also want to say thanks to, uh, to my friend and colleague, Mark Dix, for tonight, um, Claudia for um, helping out, and Paula Seven and um, Annie for the uh, music group. And remember, net up more than toasters. The last thing is scan this QR code if you haven't already. There's a $300 JD Hi-Fi. $300? Should we make it a hundred? <laughs> <laughs> right, three hundred dollar JD Hi-Fi voucher. Imagine how many AWS credits you could buy with that. Amazing. <laughs> Folks, thanks very much. <laughs>
that's not all of the AWS services that help you with cloud opti uh, cost optimization, but it's just, this is already a lot for things like that. Um, and you can see there's a lot of services, so what's the best or easiest way to get started? So my personal experience is a typical cloud journey starts with, hey Gerald, uh, can you create a new AWS account? Here's my credit card. So then you onboard a couple of projects, then an elimination comes in and you create another account. And then all of a sudden, the build bounces back. I have the get previous environment. Uh, the same credit card was covering for the Christmas party. And the AWS bill didn't get through them uh, the month after. So the payment failed. Next month, AWS tries to do <coughs> for both months. It fails again because it basically reached the threshold and so on. So the journey into the cloud cost optimization does start at the beginning because when, by the time you start looking into it, you're already in the cloud. So you're already at the end. So you want to find some data points that help you to, to optimize the cost. Um, one obvious one there is you build an invoice. Uh, the other thing is you could look into the cost of um, But just looking at the cost itself doesn't say how much money you could save. So you need to look into the efficiencies. You need to find out what's being over provisioned, for example, instances that are not utilized enough, or free floating EPS logins, for example, I had that in the past. Um, the customer wanted a solution that we automate um, volume for volume recovery, and the HDA didn't delete the old volume, so you had to run a big EPS <coughs> volume is not attached to an instance, and it cost was over. Um, guardrails are a thing that help you to put a bit of a rigor in place. And guardrails, they're main, they are necessarily constraining, they can just be a showback, like an alert that's being sent to an application owner, uh, or visibility how the cost breakdown or the breakdown is structured. Um, then at the end, once we've gone through the duration, to find out what can be improved. So at the end, the utilization number should improve. So all the all the cost spent that's not necessarily should go down. So if you measure that with uh, instances or operations at two at large, for example, could be medium sized, uh, then yeah, that, that base basically cloud waste should go down. Okay, let's start on the first two phases of the software development life cycle. Um, when you start planning your solution and you want to find out how much is it going to cost in production or in all your, across your environments, uh, an AWS tool that helps you do that is the pricing calculator. Um, it has improved a lot over the last, let's say, five years. The old version was really clunky. I'm not saying it's easy now, but it's easier. Um, so when you start using it, you need to make sure you get the region right because every service has a different charge in a different region. Sydney is not the cheapest region. If you want to save yourself some money and you can develop uh, somewhere else, maybe Dara to Australia, US East is usually one of the cheapest uh, regions. I picked a service and then you get uh, a recommendation what, what services are available in the area. You get the list. Um, I picked an easy one just to keep the slide easy. It can get fairly complicated. So here's the transit gateway. We picked 25 attachments, however many uh, gigabytes per month. And the nice thing that I really like is it explains you how the calculation works. So if you want to compare two services, where you think that, up from an architecture point of view, actually very, very similar, you can compare them and it gives you the calculation how it works. Um, I'm saying it can get complex when you use S3 or API gateway, you need to know how many HTTPS requests you have, um, how big is the average workload, how uh, the actual payload, and you will struggle to find the data. So usually, you need to go through log files, that means you need to have access to an application owner. Uh, they will probably ask an engineer or support, and, and they can give you the numbers. But that process will take a while. But it also makes clear that FinOps or cost optimization is not that long term. Um, something that trips people up all the time is pricing calculator is a public value site. So when you do a calculation that's not stored in your AWS account, so one thing that you really have to do is you need to hit the share button. That one creates a unique URL here. Uh, you need to hold on to the URL. Because chances are very high you don't want to come back. You just look at the cost breakdown or what it. Okay, next one in the first two phases is AWS budgets. Uh, fairly simple, you create a budget. Once you have an idea how much your spend was in the past, and you can set alerts based, based on the threshold. Um, I picked an example here, you have templates, that's the easier version, you can do custom budgets as well. Um, you can define a monthly expected spend. You 
give it in production, or you give it a better name than this one. My monthly cost budget is not going to scale. It's going to end up with my, my budget number one, number two, and so on. Um, a feature like is you can play around with the numbers. So it will keep you the chart of your last month, and then you can play around how, how it actually fit. So I have a $10. Uh, Eight dollar mark here, something around here. It gives you that uh, comparison of how much would twenty five percent of this one be, and gives you a feel what's actually a sensible, sensible threshold. So the first part we have seen is fixed up budgets. There are also planned budgets. You can see on the top screenshots here. Um, with the planned one, you can plan ahead for it next year. So you can start here manually populating those fields. Probably don't want to do that. Uh, or just one field and then choose uh, an increment like a 5% each month and it will be auto populated for you. It's the same as code. I'm, I'm taking screenshots here for visualization, but I hope nobody's doing it for two jobs. I really want to code it all this. Um, auto adjusting, that's when you tap into the pre can uh, thinking machine learning uh, of AWS. It will make a decision based on a time span that you pick and choose here. And a and if you're above the threshold, then you will get an alert. Um, savings plan. There are three different types. Compute covers uh, Fargate, EC2 instances, and Lambda. Then we have the EC2 type and StageMaker for anything being utilized by StageMaker. Um, you need to pick that savings plan up here. Uh, define is it for the payer account of your AWS organization or for the leaf accounts as well? What's the time duration? My recommendation is start with one year um, because after a year you'll have a lot of learnings and you might move away from instances, for example, and move more towards Lambda, save money, and then you can adjust the number the next year. Um, you can change the number of how long in the past should that actually the recommendation come out. I did that here in every percentage account, there'll be by centric organization, I should say, but we play with guardrails. Um, I found out about a limitation, I should have taken a screenshot earlier. Once you once you let that run, I think it's three days, something like that, you get a recommendation uh, on what the number is for a, uh, for a savings plan you should purchase for the annual fee, and also what the cost saving would be. Um, I did that, played around, and I came across the limitation, you can only do this three times a day. We we'll refresh. Takes a couple seconds, um, but yeah, for um, for that to be meaningful, you need to let it run. I would say for at least a week. Yeah, let's get into the implementation. Um, I mentioned we don't want to do click ops. That's the reason why I'm taking the implementation because ideally you <coughs> capture all your text in the code. So what what he's taking he's taking is just a sort of metadata where you assign metadata keys values to an AWS resource, the could be S3 bucket or an EC2 instance. You can do it in code, no matter if it's Cloud Formation, Terraform, CDK, um, anything. This is just an example of how it looks like in YAML. Um, if you do it in the console, this is usually a tiny problem. And is that the extended state that you use at Ah, uh, No, this is a simplified version. We do, we have a differentiator, uh, ours are Pascal. Uh, colon, followed by cost center, for example. Sorry, what I'm getting at is it, for this presentation, you've obviously simplified it, but do, do you use 10 tags, 20 tags, 50 tags? We one? have cost center is the number one one, which you even need in a development environment. Yeah. Uh, we have application owner in there. We have um, business domains, our business structure, business domains. Uh, we have the product code. We have a variety of data products within the domain. Um, tech contact. Is really your bread and butter when you talk about cost breakdown. It's really, really essential. Um, when you have done your tagging, you can go into cost allocation tags. That's in the billing console in AWS. Uh, what you can do is here you can select the tags where you think they're relevant for your billing. So you might have other tags that are not relevant for your billing, like security tags, uh, uh, data sensitivity, for example, private, public, and so on. So this way you eliminate the noise and you only select the ones that are. Uh, critical for your building. Um, question came there 
what I would say is because one of them is free, that's a totally different uh, the pipeline. Yeah. Pipeline control. Um, there are other services, tag editor for example, is where you can go in and tag a whole organizational unit with all the text and you know, okay, it's this in this account, so it's probably from marketing, finance, whatever you want. Uh, resource groups as well, if you combine those two, you can actually find a way to filter tags that don't have your current mandatory tags in place. That's easy, that, that's really helpful if you want to clean up and you start a tagging journey later, you want to identify what well, hasn't been uh, tagged properly and if you reach out to the business owner. Um, you can set up tagging policies. That's part of the AWS organization, that's what I'm calling it out. Sometimes it's a bit confusing where you find things in the console. Uh, Tagging policy is part of AWS organization. Uh, you can talk about cost center, define a cost center, and then define a list of valid tags. So otherwise people might just fill in the blue, you know, not have got the right tag, and it's, it's not gonna be helpful for your cost center. Okay, let's look into Bitfinet. I mentioned AWS organization. Uh, a fair bit to AWS organizations, you can define how uh, you break down your security boundaries, uh, look like how you want to structure them. You might want to structure them by, let's say, region, if you have a multi region business, by business units or by production, non production, or same thing. Uh, typically, it's a combination of all of them. Um, we have two types of guardrails in uh, organizations. The, the one, uh, type one is preventative guardrails, they make sure that actions cannot happen, so they basically throw an error if someone tries to do it. Uh, or detective guardrails. If you have AWS control tower, then that will already deploy, uh, I don't know, however many guardrails for you. So that's a bit of an easier kickstart. You don't need to write them yourself or uh, look them up on the code to deploy. So uh, what are SCPs? They do not grant permission to anyone, but they set boundaries. So uh, a, scope, a scope definition, uh, basically like a a uh, container or a canvas where you say you can do anything within here. You're not allowed to deploy to the outside Australia, for example. Um, or when we talk about cost control use cases, you are you could enforce tagging. It's not the best way, the better way with the tagging editor, because with SCPs you can just uh, validate that a tag exists or not the value. Um, you could make sure that early small instances are deployed to develop and test, because you don't need a forex large in that environment or you could deny for resource types if you want to say if you only want to use the latest EC2 family types because they're more cost efficient then it's something you can do with the SCP as well. This is an example. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, we deny running an EC2 instance that is uh, larger than large, nano, micro, small, medium, and so on. Uh, in the console, you can actually click the statement to get out and then use it in Um, yeah, this is an error, it's not very descriptive. Well, actually, I had this initially in the slides, then I deleted it. And then the engineer asked me today, I can't make any sense out of this error message, so <laughs> I might bring it back in. Um, yeah, you get this error, it's not user friendly. Um, there is a CLI command that you can run, it was SD, SDS. Um, you might remember that, but hopefully you remember there is something, there's a way how you can look it up. It will give you a chain output saying, okay, statement number one failed. Tip to use it better, use a more descriptive <laughs> statement name for, uh, for your SCPs. Uh, the reason is it got denied and it didn't match any of those nano, mac, micro, what, whatsoever size. Okay, so uh, if you recall that picture with the uh, software development life cycles, we had six phases, the last one is maintained, but I think the most important thing of maintained is that we build in that improvement. So what we do is we have a cross-functional team that comes together uh, looks up, uh, spend, security alerts, all of that. Any um, any findings that we have still left, we uh, detect the guardrails and then improve them. Uh, one of them was AWS Config. That's your detective guardrail. Uh, it's a recording service that records every change to your AWS resources. So from a time of creation to modification. Uh, nice thing is you can get a timeline per resource and then go back to the last change. Um, you can have compliance rules in there that might be not allowed to go start or outside Australia or anything to do with sizing of your instances. You can pre-end format packs. You can 
and remediation. The remediation group may be close uh, and public funded. Okay, so in this example we can see um, there's a list of guardrails that we have in place. This is our control tower, so those are our box guardrails to get the list control tower. You know, you'll pick it, uh, landing zone solution. Uh, this one shows me that uh, there's an EBS volume that's not attached to your volume. So I can probably take a snapshot of that. We want to back up and then uh, remove it. Again, this is where tag tagging is helpful because then you know that this is on those you can reach out to start us being needed. Uh, in the overview, you get a list of all the accounts that are enrolled to your config, so you can aggregate across multiple accounts and breaches. Um, and then you can see, oh, there's one account, I'm not uh, it's not compliant. You drill into it and it shows you all the rules that come. <coughs> Cost Explorer, I mentioned that earlier. Um, that's basically your dashboard that shows you in a more dynamic way what your invoice represents. Um, you can change the view on how you want to see it across accounts, for example, uh, focused on a single region, focused on a single account, uh, across, let's say, there's three buckets and multiple accounts. <coughs> so it gives you different uh, viewpoints, which is really helpful if you want to drill down on a like, enterprise view, where can you see it? Trusted Advisor. Um, Trusted Advisor is a tool that you get with the lower support levels, the free tier development, but it only gives you a handful of findings. It's, it's really just creating a type of anything. <coughs> to get anything useful out of a uh, trusted advisor, you need to be on a business support plan or a project plan. It has findings across all those uh, areas, which align for one of the things. Nothing about sustainability in there. Um, and it comes up with recommendations. So that really helps you to crack through your remediations. That's a pretty straightforward uh, yeah, list of actions that you can take. Uh, cost anomaly detection, it's another uh, great hand ML service in AWS. <coughs> way worse, you need to set up a cost monitor. Uh, the cost monitor can be linked to individual accounts or a list of accounts or to certain cost allocation tags. So that could be, for example, uh, split marketing. You want to marketing to send alert outs weekly, but you know, finance that not much happening, or uh, monthly marketing not for example. Um, you can define it here, based on the team, and it then gives you a detection history, cost savings. So as I said, if that, this is from our uh, test organization, uh, within two days, it gives you 215% potential cost finding, in our case, that would be eight cents. <laughs> but in reductions, obviously. Um, right sizing recommendations, uh, that's an automatic review of your historical data, how your instances have been used, and gives you recommendations on uh, how much you can downsize them. So again, we're spinning up instances that we hardly use, uh, and it tells me, okay, I can downsize that from small to micro. So you only get those recommendations if it's been running consistently for 20, uh, two weeks? Yes, yeah, you need to let it run for a while. Okay, a couple of key takeaways. Um, once you get started, you use existing data points, you will have something. You will have an AWS invoice, you will have the cost of access to the cost explorer, hopefully, otherwise you can test that access. Uh, invest into cost visibility. So as I said, trusted advisor, for example, uh, you need to be at least on a business plan. Uh, it's really hard if you don't have access to those tools because then you end up doing everything manually. It's not fun. Uh, you could invest in a third party tools, there are a couple of them that specialize in cost. Some of them give you a holistic view across all the six pillars through the architecture framework. Um, I definitely recommend having a second AWS organization if you plan on putting other rails in place. We do that, we have the automated, we have the same OU structure in, in, in our dev organization as the production one, um, and then start with the guardrails in dev before we push them out to production. So if you only have one, organization, that's essentially your production organization. So even if you push things out to a non-product account, it's still a production organization. So you take a bit of a, a bit extra risk if you don't have the organization. Uh, the other one is measuring and improve. So you need your data points, otherwise you don't know where you are in your improvement journey. Right, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Do you have any questions? Follow the best practices of all.
those services you've just mentioned to not get like overwhelmed by all the security or like improvement recommendations and still get the most out of it? Uh, we do, especially in the security space, being a financial services organization, we get way too many alerts. Um, we're working on that. Um, I'll tell you if that's it, this is again coming back to recommend at the moment. We're just going through a cycle where we are focusing on the, on the financial aspect, because you know there will be lots coming into the AWS now. Uh, for security, the, problem, the real problem for us in the security space is that everything gets shipped to the market. So there's no rig over around uh, what should actually be a lower security level if there's an alert fatigue. Um, in, in the financial space, it's actually much better. Uh, following best practices, yeah, there will be some in the, um, you'll find some in, in the white papers in AWS. Quite often it's really, it, it's very specific to your organization. You need to know how your teams operate, what's really important to speed. be. Um, can, you, can you afford to fail uh, at the cost cloud, for example? That's really steering those decisions along. What's the benchmark? So we typically, so a repeated question, what's the benchmark for using detective guardrails versus uh, preventative guardrails? Um, we typically try our things on the detective guardrails first, um, unless they're super critical, like straight away lockdown, we can't fly out to Australia because then we have a, a compliance issue. Uh, for the other guardrails, we test them first in AWS config, see if anything pops up in the dashboard. Uh, if, it's, if it's not fine, we need to reach out to the, uh, to the product owners. If it's fine, we just turn them into preventative guardrails. Yeah, next. Uh, given uh, your organization, what are the top three things that the, the biggest cost savings of what you do think of that organization? The biggest cost savings that we do at the moment is actually automating everything. We, we invest a lot in getting away from what was either an inconsistency or ICD uh, landscape, yeah. or was half clicked off somewhere yesterday, the information template, but it got deployed manually. Uh, that's where we go through it, then we turn it, currently turn it in a self service offering, so all the business domains have access to the infrastructure pipelines, and if they need the patterns, if they need an API gateway, they, they can spin it up. Uh, in the service catalog, we use Terraform Cloud for that, and, and Terraform Cloud Registry, um, and then they use a different technology. They use GitHub. So, regarding cost optimization, not every place where you will optimize cost is equal. Like, for example, S3 storage, or maybe versus instance sizes. So the cost that you will save in S3 storage versus reducing the size of the instance, there, yeah. there, there is a variation. So if you are coming in, in an organization with the target of optimizing their cost, what are the first or the main aspects that you would target first to gain the maximum out of the optimization like uh, activity that you're doing, yeah. rather than attacking all the aspects at one time. Um, so the first thing we do, uh, so I sum up the question, what do you do? How do you take all the cost optimization because you can't do everything first uh, and it will be different use cases and, and different business uh, context as well. So the way we are structured is, uh, we give more and more autonomy to the business units. Um, the way we structure some famous company, we have an issuing domain for issuing cards, acquiring, uh, regulating data, financial crime, it's a big part of our business as well, helping other organizations with financial crime. Um, his first, first step is really provide that uh, cost showback and turning it into a chargeback model. Um, so the product owners really need to understand where the cost is coming from because only they know uh, how critical the application is. Uh, what's the footprint of the application? For example, we have we pay twenty thousand dollars every month in S3 buckets because of the data lake solution. But the problem is not the data in the app; it's how many HTTPS calls are actually being triggered to the API. That's I, I can't know that because I don't. I'm not the the uh, business domain expert. So that's really the show back. Um, then after the conversation, uh, they will tell you, "Oh, this is actually something wrong on our side." Uh, then you can have the conversation. Well, how can we help you? Uh, the data life cycle, for example, around S3 buckets. Something where people can opt out. Uh, same for backup plans. So we have backup and uh, data retention plans that people can tap in, but only they know how the backups need to be taken and when the data can be delivered. So, just in the interest of time, if uh, any other questions, we'll just grab Gerald at the end. Um, yeah. Yes.
Thanks, Jackson. I'll just sum it up quickly. Uh, you actually have a winner now for the voucher, so so I think the, so. The voucher winner is Wagish Anand. Again, thank you again, NetApp and Tuskal. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, uh, Chris, for doing your fantastic present. I, we, we really hope that you found this educational, and we'll see you next month. So please, just go have your uh, pizza and beer. Thanks, guys. See you next month. <laughs> <laughs>